So my name is Andrei Romasyun, and uh, I am a full-stack JavaScript engineer at Strasbury, and at the same time I'm also an open source contributor. I love open source. I founded my Google Analytics alternative, which is also open source. And I love JavaScript, TypeScript, programming, and everything that is related to this field. So writing secure JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript is basically the reason we all gathered here. It's the most widespread programming language in the world. It has millions, sorry, yep, millions of libraries and frameworks and code written in it. And uh, at the same time, it is important to be able to write uh, JavaScript securely because 30,000s of websites are hacked daily, and most of these hacks could be easily prevented with the right knowledge and skills. So today I'd like to start with cross-site scripting vulnerability, which is probably the most common vulnerability there is. And uh, in fact, it's the most reported vulnerability on sites like HackerOne. And uh, basically, cross-site scripting allows an attacker to execute uh, custom JavaScript code on users' browsers. And by successfully exploiting this kind of vulnerability, they can steal cookies, they can steal login information, or set up uh, mining on their browsers, or do lots of other nasty things. There are three kinds of uh, XSS. There is stored XSS, reflected XSS, and DOM-based XSS. Stored XSS is uh, when a user sends a malicious JS, like in, uh, like in a chat application. This uh, JavaScript is stored in the database and is later uh, shared with other people from the database. Reflected XSS is uh, when a hacker stores a malicious JavaScript as a query parameter in the URL and shares this link with uh, other people. And DOM-based XSS is probably the most dangerous uh, kind of XSS there is because, uh, such, because a malicious JavaScript is stored as a URI fragment, and it is impossible to detect such uh, XSS server site because the URI fragments are never sent to the server. They always stay on the client side. And as an example of uh, stored XSS, hacker could uh, write some malicious JavaScript in a chat application, which would later be uh, executed on all of the participants of such imaginary chat. A real life case of XSS would probably be Google, Google Search. Google Search is known to handle millions of requests maybe per minute. And uh, in fact, it was vulnerable to this vulnerability in 2019. A hacker could craft a JavaScript, put it in the Google search, and uh, later share this search link with other people. And anyone who would follow this URL would uh, get some custom JS executed on their browser. So they could steal Google authentication cookies or basically do anything else. For each of the life real life cases you will see further in this presentation, I put a QR code. If you want to know a bit more details, you can scan it and uh, it will lead you to, yeah, to websites with more details. So to prevent XSS, you should always sanitize user content if you, if you have a chat application, you accept user content in it, you should treat all the HTML characters like lower than, greater than, and so on, and replace them with a Unicode representation like that. You should also implement strict content security policy which would, uh, which would prevent any kind of JavaScript being executed except the JavaScript you specify in it. So for example, you can set 
uh, this content security policy to only execute JavaScript that is sent from Jazz Deliver website, J Jazz Deliver uh, CDN. And you should always treat user's input as text, not HTML. You should use JavaScript text content property instead of inner HTML whenever possible. And yep. Coming up to the next vulnerability, mass assignment. Uh, nowadays, many frameworks uh, automatically take the HTTP request and map it for you as a variable. So, so you can access these uh, request uh, parameters later on. This is convenient, but at the same time, it brings a few vulnerabilities like the mass assignment and uh, which could be exploited by an attacker. So, for example, you can access, for this post request, you can access all of the parameters as a body uh, object, and you could pass this body object in your database to apply it. This code would work perfectly. It's supposed to update username for a user, and it will update it, but assuming that your application uses some kind of other variable like as admin to differentiate between regular users and admins. An attacker could pass this property inside the request and uh, it would get applied and it would grant them uh, administrative privilege. So this is pretty nasty vulnerability. A real life case of this would probably be Uber, which in 2016 had this vulnerability as well. It had a form which allowed drivers to update their uh, profile picture, and uh, a hacker could pass first name, last name inside this form, and it would get applied to their account without any verification from the Uber site. So if you don't want to share a cab with an unverified Uber driver, you should know how to prevent this vulnerability. To prevent this, you as a developer, it's your responsibility to always enumerate exactly what values should be applied from the request object to your database. So this code will also work perfectly, but now we specify that we only want to update username from the, uh, from the object, from the HTTP request, and uh, discard everything else. The next vulnerability is called path traversal. It's also known as directory traversal. And uh, most of the web servers uh, have some kind of public or a sets folder where they store some uh, style sheets or JavaScript or images that are supposed to be accessible by users. But if you do not set up your server correctly, um, an, attacker could, an attacker could access some arbitrary files outside of this public folder from your server. For example, here is an endpoint that uh, allows users of this API to load some files from your designated public folder. But it, it works well, but if an attacker passes a path like this, it would return a file from that path. So they would be able to escape from the public folder and read any file from your server. So the real life case of this vulnerability would be an Algolia messaging service uh, where an attacker was able to make a GET request to a static uh, path. The, it was a CDN which shared some style sheets, JavaScript, and so on. And if an attacker made a request like this, they would be able to read any file, any arbitrary file from the Algolia's server. To prevent this vulnerability, you should always use, uh, you should use a content management system or a CDN whenever possible. Uh, it's such things like file 
management uh, or file uh, sharing should are supposed to be managed not by you but by a spe special software like a CMS. But if you absolutely need to store files on your server, uh, each time file is uploaded, you can g assign a unique name to it, and each time this file is requested, you can go to your database, find the path which uh, represents this unique uh, file name, and return it. And this way, you would prevent any path traversal vulnerability on your site, and make so-called whitelist of uh, files that are allowed to be read from your server. But if you absolutely have to work with path that users uh, provide to your API, you should use principle of list privilege, which is basically when you create a new uh, user on your, uh, on your server that only has access to this specific public or assets folder, and if there is a path traversal on your site and someone tries to read files outside of this folder, they would not be able to because uh, the user that runs your server only has access to this specific uh, assets folder. And in the code uh, we saw er earlier, it is possible to prevent the path traversal simply by resolving the path first, making sure that it's not outside of our designated folder, and if it is not, we can read the file and return it to the user. The next vulnerability is called CSRF, cross-site request forgery. It is basically a type of attack that allows uh, a hacker to make some uh, actions on your website on behalf of your users. So for example, they could create a fake website, they could insert some kind of form in it and trick your users to changing a password, for example, or doing some other actions. And from their website, they, they would make a request to your website, um, but modifying some values in this form. So for example, here is a transfer endpoint that allows uh, people to make banking transfers from one account to another. It is vulnerable to CSRF because it does not make sure that a request to transfer money is coming from your server. So an attacker would be able to create a request to your endpoint from their website, from their HTML form on uh, your user's behalf, but uh, the two account would be set to their banking account. A real life case of this vulnerability would probably be a Glassdoor website, which had, uh, which had this vulnerability in 2020. It uh, allowed an attacker to make a request to any uh, endpoint of their website. So an attacker would be able to leave a review on some company's page, submit a salary, maybe update some account details all on behalf of their users by tricking them into doing some actions on uh, his site. To prevent this vulnerability, you should always make sure that all GET requests to your site are uh, site effect free, which is basically they only return information and uh, do not change anything on your site. Because GET requests are one of the most common ways of how CSRF, how CSRF is executed. You should also set up some anti-CSRF tokens on all of your uh, crucial forms. So CSRF token is basically a unique token that is genera generated by your server for each request and uh, in injected in the forms when it is generated server side as a hidden input field. And you should also uh, make sure that all of the cookies, all of the critical cookies on your site have strict or lax same site attribute and it would prevent them from being shared in cross-site requests. They would only be available on the original domain of your website. 
So the next vulnerability is probably the most dangerous one. It's called remote code execution. Um, there are two kinds of languages. There are languages that are compiled like into binary code, like C++ or C. And there are languages that are interpreted line by line by an interpreter. And uh, JavaScript is such uh, programming language. And uh, most, of the, most of such languages allow some code to be written as a string and assigned to a variable and executed later on. And it's possible to do with the eval function in JavaScript. Uh, and applications that deal with uh, user input are particularly vulnerable to RCE. So for example, if you have, let's take a Google Spreadsheets app, it has uh, a functions input in it, and it allows users to craft some fun functions that are executed on um, the Excel table. If uh, the, their app would be vulnerable to this vulnerability, an attacker could pass some JavaScript function in it, and uh, it would be executed on the server. So if, it's not, if, if the user input is not validated, is not sanitized, is not executed in a sandboxed environment, uh, it could result in bad consequences. So the first example of remote code execution is eval. If you use eval function on your server, you should be really cautious because it is probably one of the most common ways on how this uh, vulnerability comes up. The second example is probably the, is possible by exploiting object and function constructors. So uh, it is more an imaginary example, but it's still possible if, if uh, your application calls up object with uh, parameters like A, A, B that are contro controllable by uh, a user, they can execute code like that. And the most realistic example is this. So here we have an endpoint that is supposed to return git history for a file that is provided by the user. It works, but it is vulnerable if a user, instead of file name, passes some shell command, it will get executed by the JavaScript process and your application would be hacked. To prevent remote code execution, you should always, always treat user's input as untrusted. You should perform you should perform, uh, you should always validate it, you should always sanitize it, and you should, yeah, you should never uh, execute it on your server. And uh, if you have to, if you have to execute uh, user's input as a shell command, you should do it in a sandboxed environment where, which does not have access to your, uh, to the files on your server. Uh, so, it, so in case there is an RC, it would not be uh, that bad. Open redirects. Um, open redirects is a super convenient feature, feature in modern uh, user experience. So for example, there is a website and user tries to access some page that is supposed to be available to only authorized users. It is a good practice to redirect them to the login page, uh, take the URL, store it as a query parameter, and after they log in, it's good to redirect them back to the, the original destination. This can be exploited by an attacker if you do not do these redirects properly. So for example, this uh, endpoint takes username, password, and the next variable that contains the link they should be redirected to. And uh, yeah, after the successful authorization, they redirect to whatever is located on that variable. And uh, an attacker could craft a link, like uh, 
and set the next variable to their malicious website. They could send this link to, by email to some user and uh, they would open it, they would uh, authorize it and get redirected to a phishing website created by an attacker which would, which would be able to, s to steal their credentials, for example, later on. An example of uh, open redirects would probably be the SEMrush, which had this vulnerability and it allowed people to redirect, it will allow the attackers to redirect to any website without, even without the need um, for them to do any actions like login or sign up. And to prevent this vulnerability, you should always make sure that, uh, that the URL you're redirecting people to are uh, relative to your website and not absolute. Um, and in our previous code, you can do this by making a regular expression like that, which checks that the URL starts with a slash. If it does, then we can redirect them. Uh, the next vulnerability is re regular expression denial of service. Uh, regular expressions are super useful to validate texts, to validate emails, passwords, check their length, and they are pretty fast, even on large chunks of texts. However, if uh, however, some regular expressions could be crafted in such a way that uh, they would check same text over and over and over again exponentially and in, as a result crash uh, your server. A life real-life case of such vulnerability would be Cloudflare. They had a web application firewall which uh, checks all of the links in case they have uh, an XSS or SQL injection in it and they did it by using, by applying regular expressions. And they, their regular expression had a catastrophic backtracking problem in it which checked same URL over and over and over and over again and as a result it crashed their whole uh, data center. To prevent this you should never ever take regular expressions from user and execute them on your server. If you do have to, if you must use user input as a regular expression, you should do some static checks on it, like uh, save re regex package, which checks that the regex are safe to execute. And uh, you could also use other custom regular expression engines that guarantee linear execution um, of uh, regular expressions. The next vulnerability is host header injections. They, uh, for example, if you have, uh, nowadays most of the server, they have no idea what domain they're hosted on. They only know the IP address. If you have uh, an API that sends transactional emails and you t take the domain information by using host or origin header, it is probably vulnerable to host header injections. If a user, if an attacker supplies host uh, with their custom domain and you inject this into your transactional email, it will get vulnerable and they would be able to send emails to your users with their website on your behalf. The real life case of this is the US Department of Defense website that uh, treated host uh, header as a website they should render uh, they should render and uh, yeah it allowed hacker to serve any content on their site on their behalf to prevent this you should use rel you should always uh, use relative links instead of absolute like in HTML templates you should load uh, CSS or JS relatively to your domain and not past absolute links. It would prevent, uh, it would prevent most cases of uh, host header injections or even web cache poisoning. You should also not rely on host or origin headers, but instead store this information in a .env configuration file and using it later if needed. And last but not least, vulnerable or toxic dependencies. Nowadays, most 
uh, developers do not write all of the stuff from scratch, but instead they rely on some third-party libraries like uh, IP validation things or literally anything. It is good business decision because it allows people to focus on their core product instead of reinventing the wheel over and over. However, sometimes it might be a bad practice, like a solar wind attack that um, allowed hackers to inject some malicious code in their software that would later be distributed to thousands of customers. And as a result, hundreds of uh, organizations, Microsoft, Intel, uh, US Treasury website, they got hacked. And another example might be Faker Jazz library, uh, where um, an author behind this library deliberately created a new release that was broken, and it crashed dozens of applications and GitHub workflows uh, because of that. So to prevent this, you should use things like GitHub Depend Dependabot, which analyzes your application's dependency tree and alerts you if something is vulnerable, if something is wrong. You should rely on popular software whenever possible because popular libraries usually have dozens of eyes behind them, and uh, if something is wrong, they tend to be fixed pretty quickly. And you should use package log JSON file in your projects to pin your dependency tree to a specific version, the specific known good version, in case the latest one is vulnerable, so you would prevent it. Thank you for your attention and uh, looking for your questions. That was amazing. <coughs> yes, uh, give you. him a big hand. Thank you. I wonder what sort of sources would you recommend for a programmer for starters? Because uh, we've got Ovast top, top 10, we've got Ovast cheat series, and so on and so on. But what may be the easiest way to start implementing like cybersecurity knowledge into your coding? Is it it or something different? So uh, do you mean like learning how to, okay. OWASP is actually good, but a bit complicated site. Uh, personally, I would recommend you a site called Huxplaining. It covers most of the popular and unpopular vulnerabilities uh, and like highlighted in code. So you'd be able to prevent it. Uh, but other than that, uh, I don't know. I collected this information bit by bit. Uh, hey, uh, so uh, do you know, uh, could you give maybe some general tips uh, for keeping the applications safe? For example, Utiliz utilizing the browser it's, uh, itself, like the CSPs, like Content Security Policy, uh, it already gives uh, uh, a huge uh, lead uh, because it's not, not much work to set them up. Uh, what would you also recommend uh, to cover most of the vulnerabilities? Uh, yep, yeah, as you said, CSP, it is important, it's super boring to set it up, but it is important. And uh, I would probably recommend to always treat users' input on all of your API endpoints as untrusted because that is how most of these vulnerabilities come up. Uh, yep, always, always treat user input as, un as untrusted, validate it, sanitize it. Uh, I have one. Um, because, for example, this path traversal uh, issue is is the thing that you have to go into many places and check it against like many paths. So my question is: Is there any like uh, programs that can help you to check your security on your application? Uh, there are programs like Burpsuit or there is a site called Portswigger, as if I'm not mistaken, they provide software like uh, that automatically checks against common and some of the uncommon vulnerabilities. 
Personally, I used and sometimes still use Burp Suite. It is great. It's com community. It has a large community behind it. It's easy to get started with. Uh, yep. Uh, you said Burp. Why not Zap? Sorry? You said Burp is good. Why not Zap? Because I personally have not worked with it. I worked with Burp Suite. I recommend it personally. Thank you, Lena. So maybe one last piece of advice. Uh, I think the two questions were where to start uh, being secure. I guess you could easily start with uh, static uh, checking, static analysis of your code, which means slint. Yep. And if you're more inventive, you can use things like, um, what's the name, uh, Sonar Cube, which I don't believe is free. But if you're doing something big, then you should definitely convince your employer to, yeah. to invest in that. Yep. Is this a case where the question was the answer? <laughs> thank you so much. It is. Uh, it, uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you want to speak with Andre later, of course, hopefully you'll be available for questions out there when we go for a break. So it looks like this. Just before we leave, Andre, give him another hand, please. Thank this is really you. great. <laughs> Fantastic. Russo.